The fur trade started around 1640. The Europeans began exploration across a large body of water, now known as the Atlantic Ocean, in search of trade routes to China and Asia. Instead, they found the east coast of what we now know as Canada. There was an abundance of cod and other fish which were needed in Europe. The fishing grounds had become very depleted, and cod and other fish were a main part of the European diet. In 1534, Jacques Cartier explored the St. Lawrence and claimed the land for France. In 1608, Samuel de Champlain created New France and claimed this land for the French. In 1670, the Hudson's Bay Company claimed the rights to Rupert's Land for the British. These land claims were the basis of the rivalry between the British and French, and thus began the opening up of Canada. The race to discover and claim land and water routes across North America to establish a trade route to Asia were instrumental in keeping the American colonies from progressing northward. These land claims helped to establish the border of Canada. The Hudson's Bay Company was established in 1684, with York Factory being its main fort. The Northwest Company was established in 1779, with Quebec being its main post on the St. Lawrence River and Grand Portage and later Fort William being the main inland forts. After much conflict and constant competition for land, native trade partners, and trapping routes, the two companies merged in 1821 to form the Hudson's Bay Company. York Station, a trade post of the original Hudson's Bay Company, finally closed in 1957. Up until 1986, the Hudson's Bay Company still had fur trade stations, where First Nations people could go with their furs and trade for money and goods. How the fur trade worked In Europe, there was a large demand for fur of all types. Fur was made into all types of clothing, hats, and fashion. Fur items equaled status and importance in European culture. This could be compared to the bling of current society, cars, houses, jewelry, and clothing. One clothing item of large importance was the hat. There were many different types of hats depending on the use and circumstance. The most important hat in the fur trade was the beaver felt top hat. These came in many sizes and styles. One beaver felt top hat took three to five beaver pelts, seven hours, and approximately 30 procedures to make. Furs were in high demand by the British and French, as animals like the beaver had been trapped into extinction in much of Europe. The abundance of beavers in the new land, as well as other fur-bearing animals, fueled the competition of the British and French to lay claim to the land, furs, and people of Canada. So your class is coming to the Finlayson Field Center for the day. During your field trip, you'll be taking part in the Trappers and Traders hands-on role-playing experience. You'll be immersed into the wilderness and have to find food and furs in order to survive a life of a courier de bois. What is the fur trade? Why is it important to Canada's history? There were many key players in the fur trade. The first were the native people who lived here in Canada. We also call them First Nations. The Huron were supported, uh, supporters of the French and the Iroquois were supporting the British. As trades began, things got a little bit hectic and they had to work together to survive. The second group were the Courier de Bois. These were men who branched out into the wilderness. They got up as far as they could go with their canoes and had to live out in the middle of nowhere, set up trap lines, and try and make money for themselves or for the companies. The other crew were the voyageurs. Their job was to bring trade goods into the forts by paddling them in canoes and living a very dangerous lifestyle to get goods to the people who were out in the wilderness. The First Nations people were an important part of the history of Canada in the fur trade. Their role in the fur trade included mostly the gathering of furs. So typically they were seen on shore dressed in furs uh, of all different types of animals. They would meet up with the voyageurs by, um, and the Cour de Bois, going on the trade routes with them or going to the outsides of the forts. 
Um, they weren't allowed in the fort because of who they were, but things that they would bring included, as I undo my pack roll right here, so they would bring examples of furs. They would have muskrat furs, they possibly brought rabbit fur, deer fur, raccoon furs. They would have brought different types of muskrat and mink. They would have brought sometimes some more arctic type of animals down. Uh, we have an example of a fox pelt that was here. We have examples of coyote and wolf pelts that they would have brought down. More muskrat other furs, a deer fur, and the fur that I'm wearing, which was the most important fur, the most valuable fur, was the fur of the beaver over here. Okay, the beaver was the main part, or the main uh, most expensive trade item. Now, as well as furs, the First Nations people also brought technology. They brought technology such as snowshoes, the ones that we have here on the table and around. Just lift up a few of these right here. So the snowshoes are something that the Europeans didn't know about because they didn't know the harsh conditions that were here in Canada. The snowshoes helped them to walk on the snow and to be able to go out and trade with the First Nations people and also to establish their own trapping routes. They introduced the First Nations, or sorry, the First Nations people introduced to the settlers um, items made of bone. So whether they were sleds, whether they were carving tools, um, that type of stuff. They also brought the technology of medicine. So things like the white cedar was shown to the Europeans. Uh, many of them suffered from scurvy in this area because they weren't getting vitamin C, they couldn't grow fruit. So the First Nations people taught the voyageurs and the Courbois and the, and the fort people that by boiling white cedar into a tea, this would actually give them vitamin C and help to cure them of scurvy on there. Other technology that they brought was how to start a fire without using a flint and steel. The First Nations people did not have any type of metal objects, that's what they were looking for. So the idea is they introduced something called a bow drill. So it involved a simple pieces of wood, a piece of leather, and a stone, and they would use this as a toolkit to start a fire. Um, it's called fire by friction. Most people think of rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. This was how rubbing two sticks together actually worked with that. Um, now, they would also have all sorts of clothing items made out of fur. Um, and they taught the, um, the British and the French the importance of actually wearing the fur on the inside in order to keep them warm. Um, how to make shelters made of fur, how to make clothing made of fur, which would have kept them alive out on the trap lines when it was minus 18, minus 20, minus 30, and so on. Uh, I'm a voyager and I was employed by the Northwest Company from France, and uh, I would have been um, somebody who was uh, a criminal, sort of the under siege of the world, living in the the down in the dumps uh, and they employed me to come over um, and, uh, and do the fur trade. So I arrived and every spring my crew and I would start from Lachine just outside of Montreal. We would pack up our canoe, we uh, paddled the Montreal canoe which was 36 feet and about four feet wide with all the goods that we were ready to trade. Um, we would then have about eight weeks to get from Lachine to Grand Portage. So in that time frame we would have to paddle um, at a killing pace, so about 45 strokes per minute. We would be getting up at four o'clock in the morning uh, and going all the way until dark at night. The only time that we would rest is about every hour to smoke a pipe. Uh, we would often sing uh, to keep our pace as well. Um, <clears throat> as we were coming up the rivers uh, or down the rivers, there was many portages that we would have to cross. There's about 36 portages that we would have to cross, some a few hundred meters and some up to several kilometers long. Each of us was um, responsible for carrying 180 pounds, it's two 90, uh, 90 pound bags. If we wanted a Spanish silver dollar, we would then be able to carry more. There is some of us who have uh, 
in history have been known to carry up to 500 pounds. A lot of us were very short, about 5'3", stocky in stature, and we would bring lots of different trade items. We would have pots uh, in some of our urns. We would have lots of beads that the First Nations people wouldn't have. We would be trading flint and steel and also mirrors as well. So when we were portaging, we only had temp lines. So we would put the bags up across our foreheads and then we would have to carry two of these. So the second one would come up across the top. And this is sort of what we would look like along the portages. Again, if I was wanting that Spanish dollar, I would then put uh, another one on the front, somewhere in the ups of 500 pounds. Once we made it to Grand Portage, many of us would just switch the canoes, uh, trade out our trade goods and fill it back up with furs, head back to Montreal. However, some of us stayed for our three-year enlistment uh, and then they would go out in five-man crews and they would paddle canoes called the Cordu or Canoe du Nord uh, and these people were later known as the Cour du Bois. The life of a coureur de bois was a very challenging and difficult life, something to be proud of. As the voyageur went back to Montreal to get the furs back to Europe, the coureur de bois, or the runners of the woods, would travel farther north into the Canadian wilderness. We had to learn how to live off of the land, and often we would make friends with the native folks, and they would teach us how to survive. Days were very difficult and very different than they are in a Canadian winter today. An average day, the temperature was minus 35 degrees Celsius. There was five feet of snow on the ground and three feet of ice on the rivers. We had to make our fires, set up our trap lines, and bring back as much furs as we could to make money to survive. It was something, it was a sense of pride, and the voyageurs and the courier de bois often fought about who was stronger and tougher. But you tell me, could you survive in a Canadian wilderness in the 1700s? Explorers were sent by the British and French to establish forts, outposts, and eventually colonies for both nations. Once the main outposts and forts were established, such as York Factory, Acadia, Tadoussac, and Quebec, then large ships full of goods to trade with the First Nations were sent by the British and French. Voyagers started out from Lachine, Quebec, and paddled toward Grand Portage or Fort William, now known as Thunder Bay, Ontario. The large canoes, called Canoe de Maitre, or Montreal Canoe, were 11 meters in length, 2 meters wide, and able to carry 3,000 kilograms, 3 tons, plus a crew of 6 to 12. Along the canoe routes, the fur traders would have to switch from one river or lake to another and avoid dangerous rapids and waterfalls. This meant they had to carry their canoes, supplies, and loads for many kilometers on their backs. Some voyageurs were responsible for picking up the large canoes and carrying them around the obstacles that could not safely be paddled. The rest of the men were in charge of carrying the goods that were being transported in the canoes. Each man was required to carry a minimum of 180 pounds during each carry. If they could carry more, they would have earned extra money. In total, about 3,629 kilograms of cargo and canoes had to be portaged, and there were 36 portages between Montreal and Georgian Bay. A typical packed canoe of goods going out for trade would include food, dried peas, dried corn, tobacco, flour, salt pork, brandy, high wine, cheese, butter, bread, sugar, tea, coffee, and other items, metal goods including pots, pans, traps, guns, steel, knives, ice chisels, axes, sewing needles, fish hooks, iron chairs, wire and files, trade items including mirrors, glass beads, silver trinkets, blankets, wool items and clothing made of cotton and wool, as well as hats including beaver felt top hats. Men were hired by the British and French to manage the forts, transport the goods from the large ships to inland forts such as Fort William, Grand Portage, Fort Garry, and Cumberland House. These men were the voyageurs and coureurs des bois. These men were hired mainly in Europe to begin with. They were men who had no future in Europe. Some were from prison, some orphaned and had no family, some so poor that they had no homes or food or jobs in Europe. They were promised a new future in a new land. Once the canoes loaded with goods arrived at the large inland forts, the boats were unloaded by the men that paddled them and other hired men at the forts. 
This supplied the forts and trading posts with all of the goods it would need until the following summer, when the large canoes would again make the journey from Lachine. The voyageurs and coureurs des bois would have a few weeks to rest before loading the large canoes, with all of the furs that had been brought into the fort the past season. These furs would then be paddled and portaged back to Lachine. The furs were then loaded on the large ships that would sail across the Atlantic Ocean back to Europe. In 1787, the following amount of furs were included as a partial shipment back to Europe by the Northwest Company. 139,509 beaver skins were exported from Canada as compared to 68,142 marten, 26,330 otters, 16,951 minks, 8,913 foxes, 17,109 bears, 102,656 deer, 140,346 raccoons, 9,816 elk, 9,687 wolves, 125 seals. It took approximately three years between trapping the animals and furs arriving in Europe. The European explorers eventually encountered people on the shores of eastern Canada. Their appearance was unfamiliar, as was their way of life. These people were dressed in furs and had access to many fur-bearing animals. Fur was a resource that was highly sought after in all parts of Europe. The British and French knew that these furs meant great wealth in England and France. Thus began the fur trade. Coureur de Bois, some being paid by the Northwest Company and some working independently, needed to travel out into the Canadian wilderness looking for furs. They earned money collecting furs during the fall, winter and spring in the Canadian wilderness. Furs were collected by establishing contact and trade with the First Nations people. Metal tools, silver, glass, mirrors, blankets, guns, brandy, and even beaver felt top hats became the items that the First Nations people desired. If the coureurs de bois could supply these items, then they would be paid in furs, native technologies such as snowshoes and bow drills, and if lucky, maybe a native wife. So students need to know what you need to be prepared for a day at the field center. First, please leave your electronics at home. No fur trappers or traders had cell phones. Second, bring a pencil to write with. Pens tend to freeze up outside and you're gonna need it to get through your day. Next, bring a litterless lunch. That means no garbage. We are an eco center and we don't have garbage cans here. So we ask that you bring Tupperware containers or take all of your garbage home with you. Next, the morning before you come, this is really important, make sure to check the weather for Orangeville. It's usually going to be about six degrees colder than where your school is and quite often we have snow when the south does not. How to dress, this is a biggie for the day. Typically we'll see students dress like this. A hoodie is not a jacket. The jeans with no long johns, woo, that's chilly. And those running shoes, oh my goodness, imagine walking through a couple feet of snow in those bad boys. This is not what we're looking for, yet this is what we see all the time. What we do want to see from you guys is this. This is a student who is prepared for a day of trappers and traders. Billy Joe here has on a nice down jacket, some good winter gloves. Underneath here, she's got on some Gore-Tex boots, wool socks, long johns, some nice outdoor pants, a sweater, a wool winter hat. She also has on a neck scarf, a t-shirt, and a long sleeve t-shirt as well. Dressing in layers means that you're going to be warm, you're going to enjoy your day a whole lot more. We're looking forward to seeing you here for a day of TNT. Take care.